Welcome to The Rock Church and World Outreach Center. We pray that this message will strengthen and encourage you. Now here's a message from Pastor Luke Cobray. You know, I, I got to say, as we get into the Word of the Lord, uh, tonight's just a special night. And, and the reason I say that is because, I'm going to just do this because I hear it popping. Uh, one of our mission statements, uh, uh, my role here at the Rock Church and World Outreach Center, for those of you that don't know who I am, is I'm one of our young adults pastors, along with my good friend, Pastor Joe. And, you know, one of our mission statements or our mission statement for our young adults ministry is to provide a service for young adults that encourages them to grow in their relationship with God and others and transition them into active membership at the Rock Church and World Outreach Center. That's mission statement. That's kind of more staff mind. You say, man, that was kind of a spit out, you know, generic sentence. Ultimately, the point of our entire young adults ministry every Friday night we meet is to get people to grow in their relationship with God, to get to know each other, to grow in their relationship with others, and transition them into a place of active membership at The Rock. So as they grow through their young adult life, they get placed and positioned in their life and in their ministry at the church. And it's been such a blessing over the 10 years that I've been in the young adults ministry, 11 years that I've been in the adult, young adults ministry, to see those two men that we ordained this, uh, this evening, Antonio and Elijah. Both of them started in the young adults ministry. Elijah started out as our worship leader. Oh, many years ago, we've transitioned through a, a bunch of different ones, and Elijah's always our, our cornerstone, uh, the one that all of our worship leaders that we're training up come and they seek advice and they talk to Elijah now. Elijah's our music director here at the Rock Church World Outreach. San Antonio uh, started out ushering and, and SBTing and everything else that needed to be done. That was Antonio's job and his role. And we started putting him into a position of authority. He starts teaching or he's been teaching in the young adults ministry as well. And it's just such a blessing for me to see the fruitfulness of the, and, and the faithfulness of the young generation. You know, seven out of ten millennials don't go to church. It's always, as a young adults pastor, for me, it's always something that's on my heart. Seven out of ten young adults do not attend church. And so when we see people that are faithful to God, and to see God's faithfulness to them in return into their families, into, into sowing into their lives, and to see that they're having an effect on the people around them, it's such a blessing to, for me as a pastor to see that. And so I just wanted to say, guys, I'm so proud of you. Love you guys. You guys are awesome. And uh, I'm just, it, it's just, I'm, I'm glowing tonight, so, because of that, uh, not because I'm white, so. <laughs> hey, so, tonight we're going to continue on. Last week I, I taught a little message, and, and I want to continue on that thought. I think that this is, it's just fun, I, it, it came in such handy for me to just talk about some things to meditate on, on Jesus. And last week, if you were with us, or if you're just joining us this week and you didn't hear last week, that's okay. It's, it, uh, we can pick up where we're at. Is the, the title of the message is Characteristics of Our King, and we're going to talk about that part number two. Simply put, I want to just give some thoughts, some simple characteristics of Jesus that you and I can take and that we can meditate on to think about. Uh, of, of, as we go throughout our week, as we go throughout our day, as we wake up and, and we might spend our devotionals in the morning or spend our evenings with God or whatever it might be, just some things to, to ponder in our lives, to, to, to hold on to so that we can understand and realize God's view of us and how he feels about us. And so let me just go over what we talked about last week. I did some digging in the thesaurus and you'll see that and, and I used some alternative words than what would normally we might use and, and you'll see why. Some of the thoughts that we talked about last week and the characteristics of our king, I'm speaking of Jesus, specifically Jesus is, uh, the first thought we thought of was, uh, is passionate. He's passionate about you and I. He's interested in us. You've always, uh, you can always tell about a person's passion when you talk to them and their eyes light up and you see that sparkle in their eye and you know you don't have to, you don't have to pry it out of them or pull it out of them. When somebody's passionate about something, they will talk about it. And God, through Jesus Christ, is passionate about you and I. He's interested in us, in our lives, in what we go through. He's empathetic or he's able to understand, to sympathize with what we go through. We don't have a, guy who, a God who is in his high and lofty place looking down on humanity saying, what on earth are they doing? I just don't understand. Why did they do this or what are they doing? But rather the Bible tells us that Jesus was tempted in all points as we are, yet without sin. Jesus lived the life of humanity and now understands our lives, what we are going through. He's approachable. We can go before God. We have access to Jesus. We have access to God the Father through Jesus Christ so we can go before God and approach Him and make our petitions known, as the Bible says. He's compassionate or He extends grace and mercy in time of need. He, he loves us to the point where we have a, a, a compassion upon us. 
He's engrossed in our life, which means he is involved. God is not uh, to the side looking upon us. Jesus is not there saying, well, there they are. I'm here. They're there. But rather he is involved in our life in a day to day basis and desires for us to to dine with him. As we read in the book of Revelation, he is involved or engrossed in our lives. And 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 through through some thesaurus work, passionate, empathetic, approachable, compassionate and engrossed. The first word of each of those, first letter of each of those gives us a freebie that we talked about last night, and that is characteristics of Jesus. He is peace. He's our peace in our storms. To get through the hard times, as Jesus was in the boat, in the back of the boat during the storm, and the disciples were afraid for their lives, and there's Jesus asleep. And they wake him and they say, aren't you concerned? Don't you care that we're about to die? And Jesus speaks to the storm and says, be still. And they marvel and they say, who is this? That he speaks in the weather listens to him. Jesus is our peace. The peace that surpasses understanding that we can go before God, that we don't have to have a life of anxiety because these are the very characteristics of our King, our Savior, our Lord. So today I want to look at some more, a couple more for us tonight, just to to think about as you go throughout this week. Take notes on these, write these down. If you've got your bulletin, you can write them down, use your phone, whatever it might. Just look at some of these characteristics that we can discuss tonight about who Jesus is, what he is for us and in our lives so that we can understand this, so that we can see life more clearly and that we can have a greater understanding of God's desire for us. So today, we're going to look at some more characteristics of our king. I'm going to give you four more tonight. Tonight, I'm going to just say this statement like this. Jesus is our, and Jesus is. And the first thought for tonight is Jesus is, characteristics of our king, Jesus is our healing. Jesus is our healing. You see, the characteristics of Jesus, one of the very characteristics of Jesus Christ is the word healing. Not just in our physical bodies, but Jesus Christ has come to make right that which was wrong. You see, Jesus is the restorer. He is the redeemer. He has taken our human condition that is lost in sin, that is buried in darkness because of our separation from God, that which we were born into. And now Jesus has come and made right which is wrong and given us the opportunity to now be reunited with God to restore us to a position that God's desire for us as mankind is. Jesus is our healing or our healer. If you've got your Bibles, go to the book of 1 Peter. 1 Peter, if you've got your Bibles, 1 Peter in the second chapter. Not only is Jesus the restorer or our healer, but also Jesus is our physical healer. It is God's desire, church. You've got to get this, understand this. It is without a question God's desire for you and I to be healed of our ailments. Healing is for us. Why do I say that? How do I know that? How can I say that without doubt, without, without fear of, of, of what uh, other denominations or other churches teach? Because it is a very characteristic of Jesus. It is born into, bred into who Jesus is to be our healer. In the book of 1 Peter, 1 Peter in the second chapter quotes... A, a, a verse out of the Old Testament, but we're going to see this today. Speaking of, of Jesus, uh, Peter is giving uh, some exhortation to the church in First Peter, the second chapter, verse number 24. Speaking of Jesus Christ, says, Who himself bore our sin in his own body on the tree, that we, having died to sins, might live for righteousness, by whose, speaking of Jesus, by whose stripes you were healed. Very important statement. Very important statement here. He says, by whose stripes you were healed. Not only were we healed of the sin nature, not only were we redeemed of who we once were, not only were we restored to the position that God had desired for us as humans, but now we are healed by the stripes of Jesus Christ on that cross. Healing is for us in this day and age. The problem, I am fully convinced, does not lie with Jesus. The issue of healing, let me say it again, I am fully convinced, does not lie with Jesus. Oftentimes, what happens? We hear people say, well, God heals whom He desires. Or God's healing 
or His miracles or His manifestation stopped after the first church was established. But I'm telling you today that the Word of God tells us over and again that Jesus came to seek and save that which was lost. Jesus, in the book of Acts, uh, Peter describes and preaches Jesus to a Gentile, to a man, Cornelius and his family, the gospel of Jesus Christ, and he describes him as the one who went about doing good and healing all who were sick and oppressed of the devil. I am convinced that that we do not preach Jesus, the one who healed people 2,000 years ago, as our Savior, but rather Jesus who heals us in our sickness, in our infirmity today. The problem does not lie with Jesus. The problem lies with us. The problem is our belief, our doubts, our questioning, our skepticism of who God is and what Jesus Christ is capable of. You see, I have had the opportunity, the privilege to travel the world and to see other continents. I've been to, to Africa and to the deepest, some of the deepest, darkest places of Africa and, and out in the wilderness and out in the, in the, in the rainforest. And I've been into the, to the, to the, 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 the mountains and on the other side of, uh, of the Andy, Andes Mountains in Peru. And I have seen the condition of the church that does not have skepticism and doubt in their hearts. When you ask somebody, do you believe that Jesus Christ can heal you? And they say yes. They mean yes. But we have become so conditioned. We have become so educated. We have become so uh, uh, mindful of, of who are they saying and what are they saying here that when somebody says or when somebody heals, automatically the critics rise up and say, well, he paid that person behind the stage or that man that you see on TV or that man that's in Africa or that man that travels the world, that's a hocus pocus and, and those are all people that are gullible. And they go and they, they take back the people like John G. Lake and Catherine Kuhlman and they say, well, you know, that, that was never verified. But let me tell you something. God's desire for us, the church, you and I, is to be healed. But God's desire is to believe in Him and to believe in Him with undoubting faith. The problem with healing and the characteristics of Jesus is not with Him. It is with us believing. I know I'm preaching at you. Matthew, the ninth chapter. I'll just put it up on the overhead. Matthew, the ninth chapter. Verse number 11. It says, when the Pharisees saw Jesus was hanging out with tax collectors. He was having dinner with them and and healing the sick. He was hanging out with everybody who was socially unacceptable. And the Pharisees saw it and they say to his disciples, why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? When Jesus heard that, he said to them, those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. He goes on to say, uh, we talked about this last week out of the book of Luke. I have come to seek and save that which was lost. As we proclaim, Peter proclaimed, as I mentioned in Acts, the 10th chapter, that Jesus went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed of the devil, for God was with him. I just want to just take a quick moment. To to point out one of the characteristics of Jesus in healing is let's talk about the people whom Jesus marveled at. Can I just, out of the Bible, just just show you, just name some people who Jesus marveled, who he was uh, amazed at, who he was impressed by? And then we'll look at the, the, the contrary. Jesus marveled at the Roman centurion for healing. For the centurion said, you don't need to come to my house. Speak the word. Jesus says, I have not found faith like that. Jesus marveled at the woman with the issue of blood because she pressed on. Jesus marveled with the Syrophoenician woman because as he was bantering with her or speaking with her, she said, even the dogs eat the crumb of the table. Heal my daughter. Jesus marveled at Bartimaeus as his disciples said, shut up, be quiet, stop speaking. And he says, no, son of David. And he pressed further. Jesus marveled at the men who lowered their friend through the roof as he was preaching because they had great faith. Jesus marveled at all these people because they pressed in. They believed. There was no option. It was the healing of Jesus Christ. But then, in the Bible, let's look at who Jesus rebukes. 
He rebukes his own disciples for their unbelief. He rebukes the scribes and the Pharisees, the educated, the religious. He rebukes the father of the child suffering from epilepsy because he says, Lord, help me with my faith. And Jesus says to the people as they're murmuring, nobody could heal this boy. How long will I be with this doubtless gen or this faithless generation? He, he, he criticized or he rebuked those who who would not believe. The Bible tells us that when he was in Nazareth, his own town, they looked at him and they said, isn't this Joseph's son? And the Bible says he was unable to do miracles except to heal a few. Because a prophet, he says, his prophet is not without honor. So because of their own disbelief, because of their own doubt or their own skepticism, in the depths of the heart and the mind, they could not see or they could not accept. You see, the very characteristic, the very attribute of Jesus Christ is for healing. For healing of the human condition, for healing of the human heart, and for healing of our human ailments in life. And we have got to learn to trust wholly in Jesus Christ, to not have a doubt. If the Bible says to us that we ask for wisdom and we must ask without doubt, how much more than do you think about, about healing? How much more do you think about uh, spiritual gifts? How much more do you think we should see about spiritual uh, or signs, wonders, and miracles? As Pastor Jim was talking about the division of the church this morning. Church, we have got to learn to stop coming to church with the idea that if this guy says something, I'm checking out of this place. And stop listening to the message of a man and start listening to the word of God and believing it. Because the attributes of Jesus in our lives is for healing. Jesus is our healer today. Second thought for today, Jesus is our equipping. Jesus is our equipping. You know that you and I, we are not empty handed. We were not born on this earth like Forrest Gump, lives like a box of chocolates, never know what you're going to get. We're not that little feather floating around. God has given us everything we need through Jesus Christ. He is our equipping for life to give us everything we have. We have been given his words, his teaching, his example. In Matthew, the 28th chapter, if you've got your Bible, oh, this is such an awesome statement. There are five commissioning statements in the Bible, in the New Testament, from Jesus. Five commissioning statements, one in each of the four Gospels, as well as in the book of Acts. This is known as, in Matthew, the 28th chapter, this is known as the Great Commission. The Great Commission here, Jesus in Matthew, the 28th chapter. Verse number 19 is he's exhorting his disciples. He says, go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And listen to this, verse number 20. Teaching them to observe all things I, Jesus says, I have commanded you. Jesus is telling his disciples, I have taught you. I have told you. You have not only seen and heard my words, you have seen the actions of my life. You have seen everything play out. And as we go through the book of Acts, the, the religious leaders marvel at these fishermen because they realize they have wisdom that has not brought about education. They have, they have a wisdom. They have a knowledge. They have an understanding. They have life experience that is beyond sitting underneath a rabbi. They realize that they have been with with Jesus. And Jesus' commission is to teach all that we have been taught. Why? Because Jesus has left us with everything we need through his word to endure and to get through and to succeed and to excel in life. It's not about the minister. It's not about the man. It's not about Pastor Jim. Well, it, when, when Pastor Jim preaches, man, I get so much out of it. When Pastor Dan preaches, it's, it's so great. When, when, when Pastor Luke preaches, they, oh, people at the back door, man, I really like it. That's great. That's what, it's not about the man. It's not about T.D. Jakes or Joel Osteen or Jer uh, David Jeremiah, whoever else it might be. It's not about the man. It's about the gospel of Jesus Christ. We've got to focus on the equipping, not of the man, but of Jesus because that is where our equipping in life comes from. We get the equipping through the Holy Spirit with what we can do. In the, in, in the book of 1 Corinthians, we were there in 1 Corinthians in the first chapter, and Paul the Apostle is exhorting the church. There in, the first, in 1 Corinthians, the first chapter, as well again, he addresses the subject in 1 Corinthians, the third chapter, because the church is beginning to say, well, I, I'm a disciple of Paul. Well, I, I'm a disciple of Apollos. Well, I, I, that's my favorite preacher. That's my favorite preacher. And, and well, you know, and they, there was division in their hearts because of their allegiance to men. 
And Paul the Apostle, in 1 Corinthians, the third chapter, verse number 5 says, Who is it? Is it Paul or is it Apollos? But ministers through whom you believe, as the Lord gave to each one. I planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. He says, it's not about you, Paul, in the first Corinthians, the first chapter. He says, man, I'm glad I didn't baptize you. You weren't baptized in the name of Paul because the Great Commission doesn't say, go and baptize them in the name of your disciple or baptize them in the name of your apostle. It says, baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And Paul says to the church, I'm glad I didn't baptize you because you weren't baptized in me. We don't preach my gospel. We preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. And we are equipped through the gospel of Jesus Christ. Christ. Going a step further in 2 Corinthians, Paul the Apostle says, hey, we don't preach ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord and ourselves are your bondservants for Jesus' sakes. We are not equipped by men. We are equipped by God through the power, through the grace, through the mercy, through the teaching, through the word of Jesus Christ as it was made flesh and lived and dwelt among us. Now you and I take that living word that is alive and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword and we apply it to our life and it gives us what we need to succeed and to excel in life because God has given us everything we need through Jesus Christ who has sent his helper the Holy Spirit to live in us it is his attribute to equip to teach to grow disciples the very attribute of Jesus Christ man I tell you it's, just, it's hard to not get excited about attributes of Jesus we could talk for years on these we are equipped not by men but by Christ Jesus is third attribute for today. Jesus is loving. He's loving. Hey, let's not play it down. Let's not make it less than it is. Sometimes we get so used to hearing statements in Christianity that we become hard to them. But did you know that sometimes what we really need to hear is just that God loves us? That Jesus loves you? Oftentimes there's somebody that's going through something hard times or you see it on their face you know as humans we have a tendency to wear our emotions on our sleeves even if we think we're tough we wear our emotions on our sleeves and sometimes all that's needed to be said all that's needed to be heard is Jesus loves you as a reminder as you're going through life as as we're going through issues and we're dealing with things in our life sometimes we just need to hear that Jesus loves us. Yes, I remember there's a song, Jesus loves the little children and, and all the different things, and, but let's not get so hard. Let's not become so callous to such an important statement that Jesus loves us. But to remember and to always remind ourselves that we are loved by God, by a God who is the embodiment of love. In John, the 15th chapter, if you've got your Bibles, go with me there. I know we're kind of bouncing all around the New Testament. But let's look at some of the words of Jesus. If you got your Bibles, John in the 15th chapter, verse number 9. You guys all right with me tonight? Yeah. Okay. I know I'm kind of preaching at you, but it's all good. John in the 15th chapter. Jesus says these words, verse number 9. As the Father loved me, I have loved you. As God loved him, he loved us. Think about that for a moment. As a father loved his only begotten son in whom he is well pleased, now Jesus has loved us, his disciples. The Bible tells us that for God so loved the world in John the third chapter that he gave his only begotten son. Jesus Christ is the embodiment of love. As a matter of fact, it goes on in a couple verses down in verse number 12 of, of John the 15th chapter. And Jesus says, this is my commandment. That you love one another as I have loved you, as the Father has loved me, as I have displayed love for you to see. And he goes on and he says, verse number 13, because greater love has no one than this, than to lay down one's life for his friends. And Jesus tells his disciples, you are my friends. You are no longer my servants. You are my friends if you do what I have commanded you to do. But let's not be mistaken, church. One of the, things, the biggest travesties in our day and age is that we have taken the very concept that God, that Jesus loves us, and we have taken advantage of that statement 
to the point that we have become deceived in our thinking. So let's not be deceived, and even though Jesus Christ, the very attribute of Jesus is love, to understand that love and approval are two completely and entirely different things. And just because God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son is no reason for you and I to take the gift of eternal salvation and the love of Jesus Christ and to treat it like a harlot in our lives. Just like a wife who would love her husband undyingly, uh, unconditionally, no matter what he would say or no matter what he would do, that does not give at any point in time the husband the okay or the go-ahead to go and do, do whatever he wants with whoever he wants because she loves him. It's the same exact thing with us in our relationship with God. God loved us so much, the Bible tells us in the book of John, 1 John in the 4th chapter, that because God loved us, now we have experienced love. And because of God's love for us, now we love. You see, in return, God's desire is for our love, our desire, our passion, in return to Jesus. So we cannot get so wrapped up in, well, God loves me that no matter what, if I do this or, you know, I, I can sleep around or I can live, live however I want to or I can make the decisions I want to or I can call myself or I can do this or I can do that. It's, well, but God loves me. Absolutely. But love and approval are two completely different things. And God loved you so much He gave Jesus for you and I. But that does not mean that if we reject the love of Jesus Christ that we're going to be okay with God. Somebody's got to love us enough to tell us the truth. God loved us. As a matter of fact, in Mark, the 10th chapter, I'll just tell you a story. A young ruler comes to Jesus and says, Master, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus says, man, you've got to honor your father or mother, obey the scriptures, listen to the commandments, do all these things. And, and, and the, young, the young ruler says to Jesus, well, Master or Rabbi, I, I've done all these things since my youth. What else do I lack? And in Mark, an amazing statement. Uh, just a couple of words that are, that are written down for us. But in Mark, the 10th chapter, verse number 21, after, as this young ruler says, what else do I lack? Jesus, in verse number 21, it says, then Jesus, looking at him, loved him. Jesus, looking at him, loved him. And, you know, it goes on and doesn't say, well, Jesus says, you know what, man? Because I love you, do whatever you want. Because I love you, live however you want. My love for you is so undying, so overshadowing, that overpowering, that, that no matter what you do, I will love you. And you just keep going. It says Jesus looked at him and he loved him. What it means is that he loved him enough to tell him what was about to come, the hardness of his life, the hard words. And it says that he said, one thing you lack, go your way, sell whatever you have and give to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven. Come take up the cross and follow me. He knew that this young man his, was tied to his possession, was tied to his wealth. His identity was in his wealth and not in the love of God. And Jesus loved him enough to tell him, you are lacking something and I'm going to tell you the truth even if it's hard. Because God loves us. Jesus loves us so much that he, doesn't, he gives us the equipping to get out of our sin, to get out of our condition, to become like Him. And the Bible tells us in Hebrews in the 12th chapter that, that God, that don't be ashamed of the, the discipline of God. But God will love us so much as to correct our ways and we have got to love God enough to listen and to receive because the very attribute of our Savior Jesus is love. He loved this young man enough to tell him the truth of his situation. Loved him enough to tell him to be harsh when he needed. Jesus is love. Are you guys still with me today? It's getting quiet, I know. Last thought for today. Jesus is powerful. Oh, come on. So often we paint this picture of Jesus as this quiet, you know, docile, you know, timid character that, or person that, that came to this earth 2,000 years ago to give free hugs <laughs> to anybody who needed it. And yes, Jesus is gentle. He is lowly, he says. He is, he, he ha is all of those things, but let's not be mistaken. That Jesus is powerful. That Jesus is powerful. He said that I have come to seek and save the lost, but Jesus also said I have come to bring a sword to separate father from son and from mother from daughter. 
And I have come to turn this world upside down. I have come to take everything that humanity places value in and remove it and show them what real value is all about. And Jesus, the very attributes of Jesus, the very characteristics of Jesus is power in his name. Jesus is the embodiment of love, the example of the highest. He is mighty as well. He is not timid. Did you know that Jesus never backed down from a spiritual fight? Did you know that Jesus never walked away from spiritual opposition? Did you know that Jesus, when he saw demonic oppression, did not turn his eye the other way and say, hey guys, come on this way because I don't know what to do? Jesus looked it in the eye, spoke to it by name, and proclaimed the authority and the power that was given to him. And it is his very attribute for you and I to live in our lives. Jesus is powerful. Yes. He is love. I love that. There's a term sometimes guys say to each other, you are a warrior and a poet. Like two opposites. You know, you're hairy and groomed at the same time. Metro and flannel. Jesus is gentle and powerful. He embodies all attributes that we need in our lives. Paul the Apostle, familiar verse for you and I, Paul the Apostle in 2 Corinthians in the 12th chapter, says that there was a, a messenger of Satan sent to buffet him over and over. Buffeting is literally, uh, imagine a wave beating on a rock. And, and, and you've seen those rocks in the ocean and after a while of the water just continually pressing and beating against that surface of the rock, it grinds the rock down and it wears the hard edges down and it makes it soft and round and, and the rock loses its shape. That's literally the water is buffeting over and over and over again. And Paul the Apostle says there was a messenger of Satan sent to buff me, to rub me, to, 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 to break the edges off. And Paul says, three times I asked God to remove this. And finally, the revelation of Jesus Christ comes to Paul and Jesus says to him, in verse number nine, he said to me, Jesus says, my grace is sufficient for you, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Paul the Apostle goes on and he says, therefore I will most gladly rather boast in my infirmities, listen to this, that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Church, we are a powerful people. Pastor Jim said our statement. I don't know if he said it in all three services today, but we as Christians are like little batteries. You get a little bit of voltage out of that battery. You plug it in. Yeah, you get a little bit of voltage. I love this statement, man. Dad, I don't, I don't, that was amazing what you said. But when you take the church together and you put all the batteries together, you get shock and awe. Why? Not because we're capable. Not because we're able. Not because we're uh, good looking or we're smart or whatever it might be. Not because we, we're faithful or whatever it might be. It's because the power of Christ may rest upon us. Because we realize that our human condition is imperfect, but in our imperfect, in our weaknesses, in our infirmities there, we see the power of Christ in our lives and we realize now we are effective in doing the work of God because Jesus Christ is powerful. Oh, what an amazing thought. The, the, through the power of Christ, we make it. Even through this continually buffeting of the devil, Paul the Apostle rejoiced. In Colossians, in the second chapter, I'll just put it on the overhead, it says, For Jesus, in Him dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily, and you are complete in Him who is the head of all principality and power. There is nothing above Jesus Christ. That means everything that you and I face is never above Jesus, even though it might, might try to make it sound that way. Even though it try to appear as though this is a greater obstacle than Christ is able. The Bible tells us that he is above all. That every knee shall bow. Every tongue confess the powers and the principalities of this and the world to come. The worlds that we do not see. Know and acknowledge the power of Jesus Christ. Because it has been given to him through God Almighty. The creator of all things. Jesus is powerful. 
Today we were talking about attributes or characteristics of our king. Some things to remember this week as we just go through and think about and ponder upon and meditate on who Jesus is and what that means for us. Jesus is our healing. Jesus is our equipping. Jesus is loving. He's the embodiment of love. Jesus is powerful. Oh, but wait. There's more. I'll give you a freebie. If you take healing, equipping, loving, and powerful, that spells help. Jesus is our very present help in time of need. Like Peter, in the storms of life, beginning to sink, there was a hand that reached out and grabbed him out of the stormy sea and pulled him out of the dark water. That hand was the hand of Jesus. Jesus Christ is our help. Hebrews in the fourth chapter says, let us come boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find help in our time of need. Jesus says in John the 15th chapter that I am the vine, you are the branches, he who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit for without me you can do nothing. I am there backing your every move. I got you. I'm spotting you. It may feel like the weight that you're carrying is going to buckle but Jesus says I am there holding you. I am your hands. I am your strength. I am the muscle. I am your help. Man, if that doesn't make us excited, I don't know what will. Maybe an iPhone 6. He is. Jesus is passionate. He's empathetic. He's approachable. He's compassionate. He's engrossed. Jesus is peace. He's healing. Jesus is our equipping. He is loving. He is powerful. Jesus is our help in time of need. So I love how Paul the Apostle says it. In Philippians, the fourth chapter, verse number 13. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Did you guys get something out of that tonight? Praise God. Hey, listen, before we dismiss, I just want to take a quick moment to make sure everybody's right with God. It'd be a travesty for us to teach the Word of God, to talk about God is love and Jesus is love, and to not give us the opportunity to look into our hearts and to look into our lives and to examine where we are. The Bible says that a man ought to examine himself from time to time, so let me ask you a question. You examine your heart. You examine your life. You answer this honestly between you and God. Nobody would know this answer except you and God, not the person next to you, no matter how long you've known them. Only you and God know this. And the question is this. If you were to leave tonight and your heart were to stop beating and you were to die, would you go to heaven or would you go to hell? It's a relatively simple question. So let's go over that. You might say, well, Pastor Luke, I hope so. I want to. I think so. Did you know that nowhere in the Bible does it say that because you hope you're going to get to heaven? Because you want to get to heaven. Did you know that nowhere in the Bible does it say that because you desire to get to heaven, that God's going to look down upon you and say, man, they wanted it so bad. I think I can. I think I can. It's not in the Bible. You're not going to find that. Did you know that nowhere in the Bible does it say that because your parents told you you were a Christian as a child? Because you were baptized as a baby or christened or went to Sunday school or Sabbath school or catechism classes? Did you know that nowhere in the Bible does it say that because you attend church, here you are tonight, you go on Christmas and on Easter, on a special occasion, and here you are tonight? Did you know that nowhere in the Word of God does it say that because your parents told you you're a Christian, because you attend church, because you were baptized as a baby, that means you're going to get into heaven? Can't get into heaven those ways. You might say, well, Pastor Luke, you know, I volunteer. I, I served in the children's ministry. I, in my last church, I worked in the youth ministry. Or I sang in the choir. I carried the pastor's Bible. I was an usher. Did you know that nowhere in the Bible does it say that because you're volunteering in the children's ministry or because you serve in the local church or because you were a leader, because you carried the pastor's Bible, did you know that nowhere in the Bible does it say that that's going to get you into heaven? You can't get into heaven that way. You can't get into heaven because you've given yourself a title. Well, oftentimes what we do, especially in America nowadays, is we call ourselves a Christian. Well, I'm a Christian, but I drink, or I'm a Christian, but I'm sleeping around, or I'm a Christian, but I've got my vices. As if we give ourselves the title makes it okay. But did you know that nowhere in the Bible does it say that because you call yourself a Christian, that you're going to get into heaven? You know, that's like me calling myself a Dodger. I could go down to Sports Chalet, I could buy the whole kit and caboodle, the whole uniform, and sit down in the Dodgers dugout in Los Angeles. But at no point am I a member of the Dodgers organization. You know, 
as full, as, full well as I, that the security team, they're going to come and grab me, they're going to pull me out of that dugout, they're going to lock me up. Just because you call yourself a Christian, because you've given yourself a title, does not mean that you're going to get into heaven. Well, then what do we do? What do we, well, Pastor Luke, I'm a good person. I've never cheated on my taxes. I, I, I do more good in my life than I do, than I do bad. I, I try to help my fellow human being. I, I've even given to, to, to the AIDS relief effort or to the Red Cross or to things like that. Good people go to heaven, so we think. Did you know that nowhere in the Bible does it say that because you're good, because you don't cheat on your taxes, because you live a good life, because you try to help out your fellow human being, that you're going to get into heaven? Nowhere in the Bible does it say that. As a matter of fact, the Bible tells us that our good deeds according to God's righteousness are like filthy rags. And nothing that you and I could ever do on our own would ever make us good enough to get into heaven. Why is that? God's standard for entrance into heaven is perfection. But the problem for you and I is the Bible tells us that we have all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, which means none of us meet that standard. No matter how hard we try, no matter how, hard, high, how high we jump, we'll never be good enough on our own to get, it, to get into heaven. Well, then how do we get there? Listen, let's not do this your way. Let's not do this my way or some well-meaning church, church committee or author's way today. Let's look and examine God's way. Jesus in the book of John in the third chapter was speaking to a man, a man by the name of Nicodemus about the subject of eternal life. Now, the Bible tells us, describes Nicodemus as a Pharisee and a leader of the Jew. What that means to you and I is that Nicodemus was an educated man. Nicodemus had memorized and had studied the Scripture his entire life. Nicodemus could quote the Scripture, sing the Scripture. Nicodemus gave to the poor. Nicodemus had the ability or the right to teach in the synagogue or the church of his time. And you would think that as Jesus is discussing the subject of eternal life with a man like Nicodemus, that Jesus would pat him on the back and say, man, you keep on going. But Jesus says these words to Nicodemus, you must be born again. There it is. From the beginning of the Bible to the end of the Bible, it's always been God's heart. It's always been God's intention. Born again is God's way. What does that mean? You're, you're, you're defining that based on society, based on culture or, or, or the Hollywood. So you're thinking of crazy, weirdo, out of control Christianity. But let me tell you something. From the beginning of the Bible to the end of the Bible, born again has always meant the same thing. Here it is. It means that you've given God all of your heart. You've given God all of your life. It's an all or nothing relationship with Jesus Christ. The Bible tells us it's a, that the devil in hell and the demons in hell know who God is, who know who Christ is, and, and believe that he's the Son of God. They have a head knowledge of who God is, of who Jesus is, yet they're not on their way to heaven. God's not after your mental ascent of who He is. Jesus, he's not after your carnal knowledge of who Jesus is. I already know you know who Jesus is. That's why you're here. It's more than just your mental ascent of memorizing John 3, 16 and a couple other verses. God's after all of your heart. He's after all of your life. Let me prove it to you. The book of Revelation, the last book of the Bible, Jesus Christ is speaking. He's speaking to the church like you and I, people like you and I. And Jesus says these words. He says, I'm coming back. And he goes on and he says, when I come back, I better find you hot or I better find you cold. Because he goes on and he says, because if I find you lukewarm, I will vomit you from my mouth. A shocking statement out of the mouth of Jesus. And what Jesus Christ is saying is that lukewarm Christians are not real Christians at all and will be rejected and ejected from the kingdom of God. What does lukewarm mean? Let's talk about that. Let's define that. Lukewarm in terms of your relationship with Jesus, simply put, means that you're a little bit in, a little bit out, a little bit up, a little bit down. Occasional church attendance, token prayer, doing some of your own thing, doing some of God's thing. You're not wholehearted for God. You're not wholehearted against God. You're riding the fence. And if that's you, I love you enough. I respect you enough. Listen, I honor you enough today to tell you the truth. God, forgive us in the American church for watering the message down for hundreds of years. But the truth of the matter is, is that it's an all or nothing relationship with Jesus Christ. And the truth of the matter is, is I honor and I respect God enough to tell you the truth. That you can't get to heaven based on your thoughts. Can't get to heaven based on your motives. Can't get to heaven based on your wishful thinking. Can't get to heaven based on what your parents told you. Can't get to heaven based on church attendance. You can't get to heaven based on doing good things. The only way you and I can get into heaven, God's heaven, is God's way through Jesus Christ. He says these words that he is the way, the truth, and the life. No one goes to the Father except through him. So today, let's not do this any other way but God's. Just a moment, I'm going to count to three. I'm going to clap my hands. I'm going to go one, two. I'm going to count to three. I'm going to go three. Smack my hands together real loud, just like that. And I'm going to give you the opportunity. What I'm going to ask you to do is I'm going to ask you to be bold, to make a, a profession, to make a, a commitment, to make the first steps of your life and to pop your hand up. What you're doing by the raising of your hand is just saying, hey, Pastor Luke, today, I want to give God my heart. I want to give God my life. Pastor Luke, I want to make sure I get into heaven. I want to get saved today. 
You see, Jesus says these words. He says, if you confess me before men, I'll confess you before my Father. But if you deny me before men, I will deny you before my Father. God's not a manipulator. He's not a conniver. He's not going to force his way or make his way. He's not in, in heaven with a two by four waiting to whack you over the head. He's not like a little kid on an anthill with a magnifying glass waiting to burn you up. He loved you so much that he sent Jesus Christ to die a beaten bloody mess on a cross for your and my sins. And now the decision is yours. The Bible tells us it's the gift of God, eternal salvation, a gift for you and I to accept or reject. The decision is ours and ours alone. So who should raise their hand in just a moment? If you've never given Jesus your heart, you've never given Jesus your life in just a moment, if that's you. When I count to three, pop your hand up. Who should raise your hand? If you're not sure, maybe you did this as a child or in the youth group. Maybe you did this at a Harvest or a Billy Graham crusade, but you never really followed through. If that's you in just a moment, when I count to three, get your hand up. I'll see it, I'll acknowledge it. I'm a man, I'll see it, I'll acknowledge it. Who should raise your hand? If you've been living lukewarm, doing your own thing instead of God's thing, if you've been running from God instead of to God, listen, it's time to quit playing games with God, stop playing church, and let's get serious with God today and ensure your place with God in heaven forever and ever and ever, leaving hell behind. Listen, regardless of whether you see it, whether you feel it, whether you experience it, heaven and hell are a very real place. Just like you know that there are radio waves going from me to the sound booth because you hear the sound of my voice, heaven is a real place even though we don't see it. Hell is a real place even though we don't see it or feel it or experience it right here, right now. Let's shed that thinking and let's get serious today with what God has in store for you. Listen, today is a divine appointment. Maybe you were brought or maybe somebody invited you today or maybe you're just here because you found yourself at church. Listen, you've had doctor's appointments, dentist appointments, DMV appointments. Today is an appointment between you and God. Don't miss the opportunity. All across this auditorium, wherever you're at, you guys in the family rooms, I'm talking to you back there as well. Those of you in the back row, whether you're in the front row or the back row, in just a moment, I'm going to count to three. If that's you, get ready. This is your moment. This is your time. This is the day of your salvation. Don't wait another minute. Be, be proud about the decision that you're about to make. And let's go forward for God, leaving hell behind. This is your day. Today, all across the side of the If you're at home watching online, listening to the sound of my voice around this campus, wherever you're at, this is your moment. This is your time. I'm going to count to three in just a moment. If that's you, get ready. Pop your hand up. I'll see it. I'll acknowledge it. You can put it right back down. Here we go. Ready? One. Two, three. Let me see your hands in this place today. One, two, three. I see those hands right there. Four, five, six. I see you guys right there. Seven. I see you right there. Seven wise people. I see those. I see those hands. I see ushers pointing over here. Eight. I got you back over there, my man. Eight wise people. Anybody else in this place today? Nine. I see you right over here in the middle. Nine wise people. Anybody else? You say, man, I wonder if I should. You should. You should. I see ushers pointing right over in this direction. I see that hand right there. I got you right there. Nine, ten wise people. Anybody else in this place today? Say, man, I wonder if I should. Come on. I love you enough to be honest with you. I love you enough to be rushed and to be harsh, to buffet you and your thinking. Because God's desire for you is to not go to hell, to go to heaven. But you've got to choose God today. Anybody else in this place today? Your choice. Ten wise people. I got you back there. Number 11. Anybody else today? Say, man, I wonder if I should. I'm going to close it up right now. Well, hey, praise God for 11 wise people. <laughs> Hallelujah. Here's what we're going to do. All 11 of you, number 12, 13, 14, 15, those of you that did not raise your hand, but you know in your heart you should have. You're thinking, man, I missed this. If that's you in just a moment, we're all going to stand together. Nobody's going to leave. As we stand, I want you to grab your coat, your sweater, your purse, your Bible, a friend if you need a friend. If you came with somebody, you brought somebody, look at them and say, hey, man, I'll go with you. Get out of your seat, get out of your chair, get in the aisle, come meet me right here at the altar. We're going to change destinies together right here, right now. If that's you in this place, come on. Let's all stand to our feet. If you raise your hand or you should have raised your hand, if that's you in this place, come on. Get out of your seat, get out of your chair. Wherever you're at, come meet me right here. We're going to change destinies Jesus, right now. I believe. Come on, you can come. You come if that's you. You raise your hands out of your seat, out of your chair. Come on. You're the reason that I breathe. Jesus, Come on, if that's I you. believe in you. You can come. Jesus, I belong to you. You're the reason that I live. They're coming. Come on, let's welcome them. I breathe. Jesus, I believe. You can come. Well, hey guys, you can. Listen, I want to share something with you. You're not going to a funeral, all right? You're going to a birthday celebration. 
Today's a day to celebrate. You're going to get born again. Today's your new birthday. You're the first day of the rest of your life. Here's what I want to do. I want to introduce a friend of mine to you. See this guy right over here waving at you? His name is Pastor Joel. Pastor Joel is a pretty cool guy. Here's what he's going to do. He's going to take you guys right over there. Nothing weird goes on, okay? I am the weirdo at the rock, and you made it through me, okay? You got through it. He's going to take you right over there. He's going to lead you in a prayer. You don't get saved by raising your hand. You get saved by asking Jesus Christ to be the leader, the Lord and Savior of your life. Secondly, he's going to give you some free information, some literature, real easy reading as you walk out of this place, as you go home, to look over that, to read through that, because we want to point you in the right direction, get you set in the right direction and the right path for your walk with God. Last thing he's going to do is he's going to invite you to come back and to meet with a friend. Somebody will meet with you right here at church. They'll buy you a cup of coffee right before service, teach you some things about the Word of God for a couple of weeks to get you strong. Like you go to the gym and get a personal trainer. We call them spiritual personal trainers. Somebody that will meet with you, teach you some things about God to get you strong in the ways of God so you don't go back to the life that you're walking away from today. So if you guys would just turn to your left, my right, go right over there with Pastor Joel. Praise God. Hey, you just heard that altar call. You just wanted to give God all of your heart and all of your life. Now let me lead you simply in a prayer of inviting Jesus Christ into your heart as your Lord and Savior. In fact, why don't you just go ahead and listen to me and go ahead and close your eyes and just repeat these words after me. I'll go slow. You repeat them. Say these words. Say, Father God, I come to you in the name of Jesus. I believe that Jesus Christ is your only begotten Son, and that you sent him for me, and that he died for me on that cross at Calvary. I believe that his blood washes away my sins, that I am now a new creature in Christ Jesus. And I thank you, Lord. I receive you now and forever as my Lord and as my Savior. I'm going to turn from sin, and I'm going to turn with all of my heart and all of my life to you, Jesus, as my Lord and as my Savior. Let it be known in heaven, as well as upon the earth, that I am born again. I'm a child of God, that I'm saved, and I'm headed for heaven and denying my presence in hell. Thank you, Jesus. I'm alive forevermore. Love you so much. God bless you guys. Everybody just say amen and receive Christ as your Lord and Savior. So talk to you later. God bless you. Thank you for listening to the Rock Church and World Outreach Center. If this message spoke to you, please share it with us. We'd love to hear from you. You can find more information at www.rockchurch.com.